think um, this notion of lifelong learning, whether it's in formal education or, or, or networking or reading or constantly keeping yourself primed, is I think one of the most valuable and essential parts of, uh, of being successful, whether you're starting a business or in a business. You know, I think, particularly now more so than ever, um, there really isn't, uh, things are moving so fast in, in multiple worlds, life sciences, technology, healthcare, etc. Um, there really isn't time to kind of, uh, to kind of sit back in your oars. There's so many things that you have to keep, uh, keep up with and keep on top of. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's uh, a big part of, of why you'll be successful from here on in. I'll just ask you before you move on, yeah. the MSc in International Business, yeah. what was the format of that? Was it a taught master's? So it was a two-year taught master's in uh, Trinity, um, and it was with, uh, so it was an Enterprise Ireland funded program. They ran it for three cycles, and uh, um, it was uh, three days a month for two years, um, as well as uh, two block weeks um, where we spent overseas in, in, in different universities. And actually, it's just, just it's good that to, to, to remind me of something there. Uh, you know, the, the big learning for me from the Masters, um, obviously it was fantastic in terms of the cohort and the team that was in the class, um, lots of, of CEOs or future CEOs. Um, but what was really interesting was when we did our international week um, in, in both years. So we were a week in IMD, which is, uh, whichever way you call it, the first or second uh, top business school in Europe and one of the top in the world in Switzerland, and a week in Babson, which is the highest ranked entrepreneurial college in the US. And what was really striking there, okay, I mean, it was high, high caliber and high quality in terms of, of the lectures and discussions, but what was really, I suppose, striking for, for myself and others in the class was that it gave us a sense of, uh, I suppose, confidence. And really there you're measuring yourself against people who are CEOs of multi-million, if not in some cases billion dollar companies and executive teams. And when you're sitting around the table having lunch with those folks, um, you kind of realize that actually, you know, it's not like they're have amazing superpowers compared to anyone else around the table. And I think it was a really valuable lesson in terms of uh, I suppose not being intimidated, maybe isn't the right word, but certainly not being overawed um, by people in, in, in very senior positions in very senior companies. So I think that was one of the, the, the big learnings from, from the masters. There's lots of great you know, uh, uh, academic and processes and frameworks that I still use even, even on a weekly basis to this day, but I think it was that, that confidence and in terms of the international scene um, was, was a huge shot in the arm for everyone on the, on the course. You know? Um, so immediately after, um, after leaving Cork, I departed. I had done a, a summer or two working in London when I was in college, um, working on building sites, what have you. And uh, that was, I didn't really have a plan A, B or C at that point in time. So I uh, went back to London, spent six months working on uh, building sites. And if you ever want, uh, you know, uh, an education in, in, in hustle, bustle, uh, how, to, how to get ahead or how not to get ahead, I think, uh, I'm not recommending this path to you, but I think if anyone spent a few months on a, on a building site in London, um, you'll very quickly learn what it takes to, to survive in a, in a fairly um, diffuse type of environment, shall we say, you know? So every uh, trick in the book was, was being played. Um, there was people um, that you'd have to call a different name depending on what site you met with them on. There was people collecting, you know, salaries for people that hadn't checked in and I don't know when. You'd get your check in a brown envelope on a Friday and go to a pub under the Archway Tube Station just off Holloway Road uh, where they would cash it for you and take 3% off it. So they had a wad of cash in the back. It was just astonishing times, you know? Um, so that was kind of, you know, it was, it was good fun and interesting and all the rest, um, but it was hard, hard graft. But, you know, there was really, I suppose, I saw a version of my life flash before me, which was probably sitting, uh, nursing a, a pint or something, um, along with the other guys that cashed their checks and just put the rest of their cash back behind the bar, you know. So met a lot of, I suppose you'd say, sad and lonely people, really, you know, and, and fellas that have been at that game for 30, 40 years. And uh, that, I suppose, was... Uh, was a bit of a eureka moment for me in terms of saying, right, this, this isn't for me and this isn't something that, uh, that I want to stick, stick with. So two lessons there, uh, time to, to change path pretty quickly, but also um, really taught me a lot about, about you know, how, to, how to hustle and, and get ahead and stay ahead because it was, it was pretty, pretty ruthless in terms of, uh, in terms of all the, uh, the tricks and shenanigans. That's a separate talk in itself, which I'm not going to talk about on, on camera. So um, did that for a number of months, uh, then moved to Edinburgh, and then that kind of brought me back a bit closer into into uh, the world of IT, I guess. Um, can I get some water, maybe, if you yeah. have a, a drink? Oh, sorry, thanks. Um, that brought me back closer into the world of IT, so I started doing some uh, work with companies on database and structuring and uh, 
and barcode systems, um, which, you know, for the first time probably since I had studied computers, it started to all tie into me how this, these, these things could be used and how powerful and how great the potential was. Um, so that kind of got me, a, you know, a, a taste of things uh, in terms of actually helping understand and reframe my experience with the computer side of things. Um, you know, I did know enough of the basics to be able to kind of hold my own at some levels of coding, so I was able to kind of flex that muscle a bit. And uh, that led to uh, a couple of, I suppose, mildly more successful successful years in, uh, in Edinburgh and then in uh, 1999 uh, my, uh, my then girlfriend and wife was coming back to do a postdoc here in, in UCD actually so we said we'd, <coughs> we'd come back to, uh, to Ireland to come back to Dublin and we'd give it, give it the year, I had the usual cork bias about, uh, about spending any longer in, in, in Dublin so we said we'd give it the year here and uh, you know haven't, haven't, haven't left since so uh, that's what I'll say about the, the London experience, very, uh, very important in terms of, of, of car character forming. Um, so that kind of moved into a phase where, you know, particularly in the, uh, in the early noughties, the, the fashion was, if it was nondescript and you were working something in IT, it was, you know, you work with computers. And that's, uh, the reference was always, you know, what, would my, what did my parents think I did uh, and what did their friends think I did, and, you know, what broadly did, did people think I was up to. Um, so this was, uh, was me in my phase of working with computers, just noticing the graphic there. That, that does become important later on when we talk about healthcare, if you see what's happening in terms of people spending far too long at their desk sitting down. So, uh, I don't need to explain it, it's, it's pretty self-evident, but um, there's a big shift happening in terms of, of global health and that's something I think we uh, need to work collectively both um, with people that are from the traditional industries in terms of life sciences, biotech and healthcare, but also really from people who are non-traditional outside of that industry because I think that's where a lot of the, the real interesting innovation will, uh, will, will, will happen. Um, so I spent a couple of years once I came back to Dublin then working in, uh, in, in multinationals, uh, US multinationals, two big ones, uh, ACT Manufacturing and Selectron. Um, both these companies had, uh, I suppose Selectron was the far bigger one, that maybe had 1,200, 1,250 um, people up in Clonshock and Coolock and uh, ACT had, I don't know, guts of two or 300 um, out in City West. And what was interesting there was, you know, there, there, was, there was still a heck of a lot of, of I would say, large-scale, low-volume, not-too-smart manufacturing going on in Ireland. Now, it was kind of the tail end of it, and uh, what was happening around then was a lot of the big players, and these would be, uh, you know, global leaders in the, in the, in the field, thanks, um, were starting to pull out of Ireland. So, you know, thank you. starting to pull out of Ireland. So I had been working there very hard as a, as a quality engineer. I was getting into, into systems uh, regulations. I had that kind of syncs with, with doing some diplomas in quality management. So quality is a great way of kind of understanding uh, how businesses work because you end up having kind of tentacles into, you know, both the finance, supply chain, the manufacturing, the line quality, and it gives you a great kind of 360 view of, of how business comes together. Um, but what was interesting and really a, 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 um, probably a second kicker for me in terms of this time was that both those companies um, announced they were exiting Ireland and shut down, um, I think, Selectron after around 2002 or 3. And, you know, it was really uh, kind of a, a, another awakening for me in that, um, you know, there was a lot of really great people there, people doing really great jobs, people working hard, busting a gut, doing great stuff um, across the board. And, uh, you know, it was really a case of they were looking at this global map and they were moving pins around the, around the dark, dartboard, as you said, and, you know, it became unsustainable to, to, to support this level of manufacturing in Ireland. So, that, you know, the plug was pulled and that was a real um, lesson or epiphany for me in terms of, look, you know, you can, you can work hard, you can have great teams, there can be great stuff happening on the ground, but really when you're um, uh, working perhaps in a multinational of that size or at least working at a level where you're not really impacting those types of decisions, um, then, you know, the rug can be pulled from under you at, at pretty much any time. So I decided there and then after seeing both of these events happen that uh, from here on out I was going to um, work with uh, indigenous companies. Um, uh, and or companies that I had uh, a direct impact on, on the company's performance. So it wasn't going to be out of my control or out of anyone's on the site control. If the company was going to be successful, um, I was going to be a central part of that. And then I just felt that I would be in uh, more control of my own uh, my own destiny, I guess, you know. Um, and that type of creative destruction, you're probably familiar with, with Schumpter's term, creative destruction, but that kind of creative destruction has led to a lot of, a lot of spin-out companies, has led to a lot of people that kind of iterated into the indigenous sector. Um, if you look at um, maybe more so electronics, I'm sure there's a life science equivalent, um, but you would have had Amdahl in, in, in Dublin and uh, probably DEC in Galway, and so many companies um, and, and leaders of companies today even have, have come from those two routes. If you look at someone like Iona in the software 
software industry, how many companies have come out of Iona? You know, dozens. So, so these type of things uh, do, have, do have a purpose even when they implode or explode. And I suppose uh, the trick is to try and take as much positives and learning from it as possible and not let it, uh, not let it set you back, you know? Do you think it's helpful for companies then to have available workforce that are, for example, masters educated, a lot of our people here, like yourself, who have that kind of broader span of knowledge and aren't so focused on maybe the technical skill? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's a tricky one because I think, uh, you know, the, the I think I think there's going to be a rise in, in two things. There's going to be a rise in ultra specialists, and there's going to be a rise in, in generalists, which probably doesn't really help to answer the question. But I think um, you know, uh, particularly when I when I talk to to, to, to masters or PhD students, um, David Kelly from from IDEO, who's you know big global product design firm, uh, he talks a lot about uh, this notion of T-shaped people. And I think um, if you look at what the big companies are hiring across any spectrum. Um, what's becoming interesting in terms of um, you know, employability is this notion of, of a T. And what the T means is that there's somebody with a very um, deep, you know, specialized depth of knowledge, a la a master's student in a particular field, um, but they're also now increasingly looking for someone that has that top of the T, which tells them that you know, you're kind of a rounded individual, you can also maybe have an interest in you know, art or sport or wh whatever else that is, but that you can, you can speak at a, at a comfortable level or current affairs, what have you, and across that T is where you know, your, your generalism comes into play. And increasingly with interdisciplinary teams, I think that, that, that generalism is, is, becoming, is becoming really important. So, you know, there's still a huge demand for the, the, the depth of the team, so don't let that put you off what you're doing. But I would, const you know, really think about what, what, what forms the top part of your bar, you know, and, and, and what extra do you bring to the table. And that's what, that's what people are going to be looking for now, because um, the, you know, the number of graduates that have, um, have that level of training is, is, is on the increase, so the competition is, is, is more fierce. So you're looking for something extra to differentiate on above and beyond, you know, the academic results in and of themselves, you know. So then I switched to uh, an indigenous company, uh, real time. So uh, funnily enough, the, these when 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 Selectron was was shutting down, um, real time, which was an Irish um, contract manufacturing company, um, had been building their facility just over the fence from us. So for uh, for the three or four years I was at Selectron, and particularly for the last uh, six eight months I was at Selectron, we could see this building being built up, but we were uh, we were rolling the other way. Um, so I said, oh, I better go and have a chat to to those folks and. Uh, literally moved over the fence. So finished on a Friday and started on a Monday in real time, uh, again on the kind of quality engineer regulatory standards side of things. So um, first order of business there was to get uh, the regulatory standard ISO 13485 into place, which allows you to make manufacture, uh, design and manufacture medical devices. Um, so it's kind of an industry standard now in terms of, and a lot of life science stuff as well, that applies to ISO 13485. Um, something similar to the FDA type of, uh, of rules in, uh, in, in the US. Um, but it's, you know, it was a real large success story. And this is, I suppose, where you know I'd made the switch to indigenous, um, but in terms of getting raw exposure, I suppose you'd say to, to an entrepreneur, I was working directly with the CEO Paddy White, who had built and, and founded that business um, from 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 scratch back in 1999. So um, you know his business was going the other way. Well, a lot of the multinationals were pulling out. So it was a case of trying to understand: Well, is there a place for manufacturing in Ireland? And at the time, we were making a bunch of, of medical devices. We we're doing some telco stuff, but a heck of a lot of medical devices actually, uh, more smaller batch, higher higher complexity. And I had various roles then through uh, from from the quality engineering side, through to project management, through to. Um, through to operations, through to biz, biz dev, which again put me in touch with uh, with a lot of, I suppose, fingers of the business and also our uh, our competitors. Now that that that's becomes interesting. Then, uh, particularly during the, the you know the big boom years in Ireland of oh, three or four or five or six, um, we had a real tough uh, couple of years at real time, and uh, that was probably compounded by the fact that you know all of my uh, friends and and peers at this stage were you know going through the rocket, getting you know five grand just to show up for an interview and. Some, in some companies, so it was a real uh, kind of make or break time. Um, real time contracted massively from a, I'm going to say 80, 100 down to probably you know 20 folks. So real, um, you know, backs to the wall. I you know should I stay? Should I go? What what's going to happen uh, both to the company and to me personally? Um, but. You know, I decided to stay, uh, and I was probably uh, only one of two senior people that, that, that stuck through it, along with the, the CEO and founder. And those two years, in, in a lot of ways, um, really helped to steal me, I suppose, for, uh, for what was coming. Um, people talk a lot about the kind of scars that you, uh, that you need to have, and if it's, um, well, I don't know if anyone that has just a pure upward curve, but um, having a few scars is, uh, is I think, invaluable. And, uh, 
you know, as I said, it was there were some bleak, bleak days which, which kind of positioned me for the entrepreneurial road in terms of doing a startup because there are plenty of bleak, bleak days when you're, when you're trying to build a business. Um, but this was, was really telling. So we had a, about 80% of our business was one customer. That customer pretty much, uh, we, we kind of finished out with them and we had a massive shock within six months. You know, the revenues just went through the, went through the floor. Um, so I remember, you know, several days just wondering how we were going to do it, how could we bring in new business and kind of turn the corner, I think, um, Probably 12 months in, uh, when one day you know we'd been trying everything to try and bring back new business and try and particularly balance the load of business so that there wasn't uh, like an 80% on, on any particular area. Um, and what happened was I was going through the list of anyone that had ever contacted us and literally picking up the phone and spending my day ringing people that we had either once quoted, once met, seen at a conference, passed in the street. Um, and uh, some of those would take our calls and some of them would have the meeting. But one of them in particular, um, you know, just timing had a great a great part to play in it. So they were having uh, issues with their with their current supply chain. There was a number of things happening uh, for them and there were a number of reasons why they said, yeah, we'd, we'd actually like you to come in and, and, and speak with us. So um, went in and and over probably, you know, three to six months had uh, had put together the deal to, to bring in their business and that um, that kind of really stopped, stopped the rot and help the company then to, to build a solid foundation to go forward from. But again, you know, that notion of, of I suppose, persistence and, and trying everything and not being shy of, of, of ringing, picking up the phone and almost harassing people because, you know, there's a lot on the line here. Um, that, that, that paid off. And there were plenty of days when it, when it didn't seem like it would, but it, those two years were actually, I suppose, uh, very critical in terms of my own formation, um, in terms of giving me some uh, some steeliness, I suppose, to, to move forward. So, and the business survived and thrived, and, and is, is leaner, stronger, growing ever since. So, when the when the uh, yeah, go ahead. I was going to ask, how do you keep your um, motivation morale high during times like that? Because you want to when you yeah. say you just decide to pick up the phone and keep calling. Yeah, you know, it's oh, I, like I, I don't know if there's a motivation one on one answer to that. I think um, I'm. I'm deeply optimistic all the time, kind <laughs> of no matter what's happening. Irrationally, yeah. irrationally optimistic at times, yeah, and uh, and that's no bad thing, right? <laughs> Being irrationally optimistic, and sometimes it'll come, it'll, it's going to come back to bite me someday. But uh, I wasn't feeling too optimistic at five to eleven when I was over in Nova, I can tell you. Um, but I, I think just just you know deeply or irrationally optimistic is is really part of of what you need. There's a bunch of there's always going to be bumps in the road. There's always going to be um, people, things, events that are going to knock you back. Um, but I suppose the difference really for uh, for people that have a I suppose a burning ambition to be successful or to make businesses successful is that you keep you keep getting back up. I mean, this was a, the backdrop of you know many of my friends and colleagues had we'd have to you know leave people go, but also I was in a I guess a kind of a, a leadership role of sorts in the company, so people would look to me um, for that motivation and 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 confidence and belief. So I think it's very important in those instances as well in terms of of leadership as opposed to management that that um, you know you keep keep the cylinders going and, and keep optimistic and keep picking up the phone and eventually that breakthrough came and then um, you know the people that, that, that stuck with us at the time um, really blossomed kind of thereafter as well but there's no there's no scientific answer it's just you know you, you, you know I'm, I'm highly self-reliant and self-motivated and, and hugely optimistic um, kind of almost no matter what happens um, so I think that's that's the way you need to look at situations. Even like when companies were closing, when I was on building sites in London, they were ridiculous days, but I'd always try and think, well, you know, well, what, what, what's happened today? What's, you know, what's happened at the end of the week? How have, uh, what have I learned? What tips and tricks have I picked up? So I think you can always find a learning or a benefit in a situation, you know, um, if you, uh, if for some people they have to look harder. For, for me, it kind of pops up almost straight away, you know. Um, so survived and thrived into uh, into further years, and then um, we wanted to kind of further insulate ourselves against the. Uh, this is where it gets a bit more life sciencey, David. See so panic in there. Uh, the uh, this is this. Uh, we, we wanted to get further up the chain and kind of insulate ourselves from what had happened in terms of the uh, of, of customers. You know, just just being able to switch from us relatively straightforwardly. So we started getting into design, but also we said, well, is there a way of, of kind of getting our hands on our own product? Um, so luck and timing again has a part to play in in most of these things, and in the summer. Of 2007, we were speaking to Enterprise Ireland saying, look, you know our pedigree, you know what we can do. Um, we'd really be interested in licensing some technology um, to kind of get our hands on our own product, because up to that point it was subcontract to design and manufacturing. And Intel at the same time were speaking to Enterprise Ireland saying, we've got this cool technology called Shimmer, 
we don't really know, you know what to do with it. It's not going to move the needle for our share price, which is a, is, is, is a revenue of, of like 100 million up is when they consider launching a product. Um, so it was quite a, quite a bit away from that, but they knew it was something interesting and something, something kind of cool. So they were speaking to Enterprise Ireland and said, we've got this tech shimmer. Um, there was a bit of, I suppose, courtship over that summer, and then we agreed to agree um, by the start of 2008. We'd done a worldwide uh, exclusive licensing deal. So I had then at that point said, well, I, I want to, I'd led the negotiations for the licensing agreement and deal, and said at that point, I want to I stay and build this up as a division within real time. So we ran it as a standalone enterprise, um, ran our own P&L, uh, hired, hired our own team for finishers, uh, and it's still going by the way, I just, I just departed, but um, there's, I guess, got to 20 people between Dublin and Boston clients in 60 countries and uh, we had uh, pretty much treble digit revenue growth every year for the five years uh, and, and I believe that trajectory is, is continuing. Um, so, you know, that was a, a, a solid success story in and of itself and, a, you know, an exercise and a case today, I suppose, in licensing, which again could be another, uh, a whole other talk. Um, but what, what the technology was about there was, was wearable sensors. So I don't know if anyone had seen the kind of the jawbone ups of this world or, or something similar, but um, the notion with Shimmer uh, was that there's so much happening in healthcare and so much happening in life sciences and so much happening in computing and all of these worlds are starting to converge together. Um, it became kind of um, evident that the brain's trust of universities, academias and clinicians were probably spending too much time cooking up devices to try and get readings and get data from people in terms of wearable sensors. So what we offered was a platform that was um, broadly open source in terms of the code, raw data, and it solved the problem of, um, of people trying to tackle clinical challenges, spending too much time on the wrong stuff, which was hardware. Really, the focus of the brain's trust should be on um, converting the data into information. So we can generate data till the cows come home, but it's only when people get a clinical understanding of when that's significant, um, does it get more interesting and, 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 uh, and of use. Um, so that, that brought uh, us as a company and me personally into contact with, with a number of people around the world. So it was a uh, couple of examples. We um, did extensive work and had a strategic relationship with the Harvard Medical School where we're working with them on uh, Parkinson's to look at measuring people's tremors or dyskinesia uh, and working with the clinic clinicians there to optimize the drug regime for, uh, for patients. It really is a drug's cocktail for Parkinson's and what you're trying to do is minimize the side effects and optimize I suppose, the personal nature of the, of the, uh, of the prescription um, but it's very difficult to you know, independently assess what those side effects are and, and how you can fine tune it. So the patients would come into clinic um, put uh, shimmers on and we would then measure their tremors or dyskinesias and relate that to the, uh, to the drug regime they were on and what the, the um, clinicians were doing was really turning the dials and optimizing their drug regime so that people would, uh, would have minimized side effects and higher efficacy. So that was one of the use cases but you know, we, there was also um, people using it to track when you'd fall asleep at the wheel driving from Brussels to the south of France and trying to come up with algorithms to understand what changes in your vital signs were indicating that you're about to fall asleep um, very interesting for, for, for professional drivers, long distance lorry drivers. Um, did a bunch of cool stuff. We did a series with the, Disco the Discovery Channel called uh, Super, uh, Super Humans, where we measured the extraordinary capabilities of various people with, uh, with amazing powers. Um, if anyone is interested in that, uh, my favorite was uh, this guy called Stig Severinsen, who is uh, one of these free divers, and he can hold his breath. Um, he's the world record for holding his breath. Anyone want to give a guess what the world record for holding your breath is? <laughs> Two and a half minutes, any advance? 14 minutes, good. 17. 17. 22 minutes is the record. <laughs> so uh, I get dizzy long before two and a half minutes. I try to. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's it. Uh, no, actually, unfortunately. So we have to keep, keep searching, you know. Um, but, you know, the, the, I suppose the point being that it was a very, uh, you know, diverse platform, but real leading and bleeding edge. And, and, you know, some of the top minds, universities, plenty of them in use in UCD as well, by the way, I should say. Um, uh, so, so several of the, of the top minds in, in healthcare and healthcare research around the world using it, which was, a, I suppose, a testament to the pedigree of what it was. And um, the Shimmer team worked hard to make sure that there was lots of fresh air between what was current when we did the license and uh, what was current, uh, you know, as of what we, what we were shipping today. So I think we're probably four generations on from what Intel would have licensed to. So again, it was all about building up that smarts in the, in the company. Um, we also had what I would call real world applications. So with people like Telefonica, for example, in, in Spain, we have a product on the market. Um, 
called Rehabitic, which uh, is concerned with rehabilitation, remote rehabilitation for people who've had a total knee replacement. So when you get your knee replaced in Spain, you hire from the hospital a kit. The kit has a touchscreen PC, a couple of sensors on it. And uh, when you go home, you stick that on and you start doing your physiotherapy. If you've had a total knee replacement, that drives an on-screen avatar, gives you some real-time information as to how you're progressing against your rehab program, um, but also then pings that back through Telefonica's networks, pings that back to the clinicians so they can keep, uh, keep an eye on things and make sure that you're uh, your rehab program is progressing. So, you know, could talk for hours on the interesting use cases that, that people came up with for that, but what was beginning, I suppose, to, uh, to frustrate me in Shimmer, notwithstanding its success and, you know, my, my passion for the team and the technology and all the rest was that really, um, Five years in, I wasn't seeing the impact in terms of, of real healthcare outcomes. Uh, you know, you still see DOS when you go to hospitals, you still see, you know, crappy design in, in medical technologies and devices, and you still see people really, I think, coming at uh, uh, certainly a large cohort of people trying to tackle healthcare as a, as a technology problem and very much with a technology lens. And really, um, I just felt that the innovation needs to shift to, you know, the service delivery and, and the impact end of the business, which kind of brings me on to, on to Health Founders, um, which is which is a new venture um, that I started with uh, Dr. Johnny Walker back in uh, June, July of this year. So I'll talk in, 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 in a bit of detail about the product and service we're designing, but to give you kind of the, the, the overview, um, it's really about disrupting the current hospital-centric doctor-focused model. So I suppose applying what I had learned and understood on the technology side and then joining forces with Johnny, who is a clinically active interventional radiologist, but also a serial entrepreneur who had uh, built and exited a number of businesses along the way. So he had a, he had a very strong track record. Um, but we were both very aligned in terms of, of what we felt we could do together and how we felt we can, uh, we can impact and make real change to, to the healthcare system. There are a number of macro drivers in terms of shifting demographics, percentage of GDP and GNP that's being spent on healthcare. These things are unsustainable and the, the graphs are all going up at the moment and that, that's just not going to last. We've seen, uh, we've seen what's happening with Obamacare in the US. We've seen even the HSEs. Uh, the Minister uh, Riley was talking on the radio this morning and we had about the budget saying that there is a shift out of hospital-centric models into primary care. And primary care is good, but we think that that doesn't go far enough. There's really so much now that can be done in the home and from people's homes um, that uh, that's being, I suppose, left on the table or not factored into these types of, of innovation. And I think, interesting quote from a guy called Clay Shirky, um, that these tools don't get socially interesting until they get technologically boring. So we're at the stage now where we're all carrying around a, you know, a smartphone or a variant of a smartphone. Um, there's a bunch of sensors in that. Some of us are voluntarily wearing other sensors to track, uh, to track things. And really, we need to start harnessing that, that, that power, that computational power um, that, that's in all of our pockets. And that can actually deliver so much to, uh, to healthcare. Yeah. What's your wrist thing? It's a, it's a, this particular one is a jawbone up um, and it tracks my uh, steps, calories burned, uh, sleep, deep sleep, light sleep, etc. Um, you, uh, you can set at the optimum time for a power nap, which I didn't know was 26 and a half minutes. So you can set it to vibrate if you go for a snooze and it'll, uh, it'll vibrate to, uh, to wake you up at that point in time. So there's a, there's a variety of those types of counters uh, and they're much more sophisticated than pedometers that were around a few years ago. You know. Uh, no, this one isn't. This one, you plug it into the headphone jack. Um, there are plenty of others that wirelessly sync. Um, so, you know, I can show you afterwards if you want to have a look. But plenty of others that wirelessly sync. But the market for, for these types of devices is growing at a real exponential rate. So part of what's happening is that there's a consumerization movement in healthcare where people are starting to, uh, to purchase these devices of their own free will rather than being, you know, prescribed a device, which is a big shift in, in how people think about their, uh, their, their healthcare, you know? Um, so the, I suppose the, the, if you were to put it into a, to, to a, to a couple of words, we're really on a mission to engage, embrace, enable, empower and educate patients and look at rebalancing things from, um, from that doctor centric, you know, white coat, you go in and you sit at a desk and you just get told what's wrong with you and you, and you go home and you get fixed. Um, this is where we're moving into Prezi PowerPoint a hybrid here, so uh, bear with me if there's any uh, hijinks here. Um, and really there's a bunch of enabling technologies, but again stressing it's not about the technologies. We now have this computational power in our, in our hands and we can do so much with it and we can do so much with that really portable PC and computer that's in our, in our, in our hands to, uh, uh, to improve how healthcare can be delivered. You know? So um, one of the things that we're uh, very bullish on is that um, the notion of the uh, 
female really as the healthcare custodian um, for, for family groups. Now this is shifting in certain demographics for sure, um, but there's statistically you know, massive evidence we've observed in, uh, in, in the Hermitage with, with Johnny's um, clinics that in over 92% of cases, the people who attend with the patient is the female. It might not be the mom, it might be the sister, it might be the aunt, it might be the neighbor, but in the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, it's, it's the female. In the US, uh, the latest figures we have from Rock Health are about 85% or north of 85%. The health person who catches that health ball in the household is female. Now it's changing. Not everyone who is catching that health ball is maybe delighted to be in, uh, to, to, to be holding it. Um, but it's a reality that I think people need to kind of call out and start addressing as we think about how we design products and services uh, to impact healthcare. Um, so that's that's our our. our uh, I suppose one of our big ideas, and Jinga was a 15th century African warrior queen who defended her people, fought off uh, colonial invaders, and did a bunch of uh, did a bunch of good, powerful stuff in terms of protecting her uh, her flock or her people. Um, so we took her as a, as an inspiration point for uh, for the platform that we're trying to build. So as I said, there's a number of, of balls in the air that everyone's juggling these days. Um, far from uncommon now for, for, for uh, two people working in a household or even in an individual type situation, everyone's really busy, right? Um, lots of things happening. The health ball, as we said, invariably tends to be caught by the, uh, by the female or the Jenga. And uh, really we want to start thinking about how can we, uh, uh, by acknowledging this fact, how can we, how can we make some improvements to um, what Jenga's problem is. And, you know, there's, there are a litany of problems, but there's four probably that are, that are key, is that there's a lack of meaningful personalized information um, available to her. Um, when you do go to the doc, it's very, uh, it's very impersonal. You find yourself giving your history, then you go to the next doc, you give your history again. You know, this notion of personalized care is, is kind of, uh, it certainly hasn't been personified, I guess, at the moment, you'd say. Uh, voice is not heard. Um, clinicians um, oftentimes will speak over around the patient. They'll speak very coldly. Um, they'll speak, they'll use Latin terms. They'll, you know, and, and not necessarily through fault of their own. A lot of times they don't realize they're doing it, but they can't help themselves because that's how they were taught and that's how medicine was delivered. Um, and healthcare was delivered for, uh, for, for, for a heck of a long time. Um, also there's system overload, so anyone that's had any brush with uh, any type of either primary care or, or hospital systems um, can, can, uh, can testify to that. Um, car parking problems as well in hospitals. It's a big, uh, and again, it's a real, it's a real a challenge for people, you know. So, so these things are, are add to the hassle and the stress, and really there are, you know, there are times you need to go to a hospital to a doc for sure, but there's so much that could be done to obviate um, what's happening in that, in that space. And Really, it's the conveyor belt of care. Average GP time, uh, depending on whose numbers you look at, anywhere from eight minutes to about 14 minutes in this part of, of Europe, should we say. Um, that could be three hours out of your day. You know, you have to take time off college, you have to you know, go pick up the kids, take time off work, whatever it is. Three hours to get eight to 14 minutes face time where you're really just cranked through and, and, and you know, the next person in the waiting room is, is in again. Um, so that's really not what, um, what we think healthcare should, should be about. So we've two uh, two initial offerings that we're um, um, that we're pursuing. The first one is is ready, um, which is this. Uh, it should actually be it's now a 30 second video tool, just to bandwidth constraints. But we've got a, a 30 second video tool where you can uh, record uh, a video, and it uh, you can then send that via an email link to your uh, to your clinician or to your patient. Um, so there is no shortage of, of video apps. The amount of video traffic is, is growing at a phenomenal rate. Um, I had a talk yesterday, 50% of the traffic going to a mobile phone these days is video. It's going to be 75% by 2017. So video is, is growing um, at a pretty phenomenal rate. But um, what's interesting is that video forms a different type of social contract and hits a different part of the brain in terms of how you can communicate with people. Um, and I will talk about a use case example, but people, people lie to their doctors every session. Um, people um, are starting to really devalue the power of the text message in terms of reminders and alerts and nudges and uh, you know the resourcing to get even a two-way Skype call or something of that nature together or a phone call takes a heck of a lot of resourcing because you need to get people organized to both ends of the phone. So what we're proposing is a system whereby you can uh, record a 30-second video, um, email that off to your initially to your to your patient. Uh, we want to create some demand on the on the on the on the hospital and care side initially, uh, but ultimately from the patient into the into the clinician and we've. Been been using this um, through Johnny's practice 
for the last number of months to uh, impact his no-show rates. So see if a simple intervention will work with this. Now the typical no-shows for interventional radiology are between 12 and, uh, 12 and 18 percent. Um, so touching you know, one in five, one in six type numbers. And people don't not show up for their, uh, for their, uh, for their appointments because they um, missed the bus or because it was bad weather. Um, they don't show up because of fear, fear of the unknown, fear of what's going to happen, fear of the outcome. So um, that causes massive problems in terms of, of hospital resourcing. Um, there's the guts of a thousand euros worth of consumables popped open, ready for the patient to come in. The patient doesn't show up, they're gone. Um, but also, critically, clinically, some early stage cancer cells, for example, will double in six weeks. So if you do miss your appointment, you know, that could be a real negative outcome for you. So what we've been doing is sending these, uh, these video, um, videos to the patients. So the, the uh, surgeon and his team will go through the patient list each, each, uh, the day before each, each surgery, see about 15 patients. Um, call them by name, do a quick recording. Hi, I'm Johnny, this is the team, this is Mick, this is Anne, uh, this is where you'll be tomorrow. Looking forward to seeing you, get a good night's sleep. 30 seconds, bang. Uh, and that goes to the patient and then there's a bunch of analytics engines and a bunch of encryption. There is some whizzy tech under the hood, but, but broadly speaking, it's much more about the use case than the technology. So there are some healthcare related regular things that we've done under the hood, which are interesting, but not probably for this talk. And just with that intervention, um, so they can do the 15 patients videos now in less than 10 minutes. Um, just with that intervention, the no show rates have dropped to less than 2%, which is kind of natural zero because guess what? Some people you know, do miss the bus or what have you. So that, that's a massive impact for really a, a simpler intervention. And I suppose we're using that as a, as a flagpole to get people thinking about it doesn't have to be big, heavy duty, healthcare IT infrastructure type projects. Sometimes you know, the answer is, is, is staring you in the face, literally. Yeah, um, it's a it's a mix. There's certainly a fairly entrenched and uh, and sizable cohort of, of clinicians and medics who 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 aren't going to go down this path with us. Um, but our view is that um, you know the progressive primary care groups, the progressive uh, physicians and clinicians um, from all disciplines um, are starting to put their hand up and they're saying, actually, yeah, this is this is what we need because they they can see the wall that's coming. You know, these are people that maybe have another. Uh, you know, 20, 30 years of medicine ahead of them, and they, they, they know that things are at breaking point, and if things aren't done differently. Um, I guess the folks that were trained in a certain way um, uh, through, I suppose, no fault of their own, find it maybe more difficult or more challenging to embrace this type of approach. Um, we think that whether it's, you know, it's not going to be this year or next, but if you look at even the medium term trends, that type of mindset. Uh, is, is, is on a downward trend and actually the mindset of anyone who's graduating from, uh, from college, med school or any kind of discipline such as that for the last even f f certainly five years, maybe even ten years, um, doesn't have time for people wheeling in carts of patient records, doesn't have time for people not using the technologies that they use every day. You know? So I think there's a, uh, it's not going to be an overnight thing but the, you know, the trend medium and long term is, is that people are starting to embrace this. You know. I want to add as well that current med program here in the city that you know the size of a part of their education is computer aided learning. So this would be much more acceptable to them as a product of their training. Yeah, yeah, great. So, so, so that, and they're the type of, you know, this isn't a costly intervention. It doesn't take a lot of, a lot of integration to do. Uh, it's simple and it works and it's effective. And we're also working on a, on a, um, a significant pilot with with a major pharma company um, that started this month, where we're using it to reach out to patients. So again, the consultants would send messages to patients who are on chronic uh, medication regimes, looking again at can this video um, persist in forming that different type of social contract. And the initial results are, are hugely positive. So we think this could be a, a very important tool and that creates the outbound which gets you know the clinicians and healthcare systems used to dealing with this type of technology um, rather than you know patients coming in initially and sending these these video links and then going you know well what are we going to do with this so it kind of socializes the idea um, in a fairly light touch way in, uh, in inside the circle of healthcare and then the other piece which uh, we're building at the moment is the uh, is the Jinga digital uh, digital tree or the Jinga life tree and what this is about is really um, taking control and putting the Jinga at the center of her healthcare world. So um, a lot of systems, there's a lot of move towards electronic health records, uh, medical records and hospitals, which are, that's sure, a positive step. Um, and there's some, um, I suppose, progressive moves being made towards um, integrating and allowing patients access to those records. If you look at people like Kaiser Permanente in the US, probably you know, really blazing a trail in how that's being done. But um, that's still very much anchored and, and founded in the, in, the, in the old method of, of healthcare thinking, that it's kind of a mainframe, there's a repository, and we'll allow you access to the information that we have on you. And 
you know, we'll, we'll maybe let you take a peek from, 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 uh, from, from time to time. But what we're saying is there's so much that happens in between um, your interactions with healthcare and there's so much that happens on a day-to-day -day basis that you're either tracking through sensors or you're at the chemist or something of that nature that actually isn't really corralled or, or, or kept anywhere at the moment. Um, what if we gave people the power to uh, control and manage their own data? So you would, the notion being that you would, you would load up the tree, the branch of the tree being you know, your family history uh, out to one degree either side. You would have a branch for anyone on your care pathway, uh, maybe the kids, maybe the in-laws, you know, whoever. And each branch would have their history, but also that you would, you would attach a, a leaf to the branch every time there was a healthcare interaction. So if you're at the dock, you got, um, you got a certain prescription, you would tack that up, you would maybe make a note about the, about the outcome or what happened. Um, Ear infections was a big thing in my house with kids for a long time, and uh, you kind of know once you're in the loop for that stuff, particularly if you're in DDoC or emergency uh, care, um, you kind of know what needs to happen, you know what not to give them, you know what should be given. Um, but a lot of people um, don't, I suppose, don't think that way or have that level of, of empowerment. So um, what we're about really is, is, is having this central repository that's owned by the Jenga that can collate really and curate her healthcare um, uh, data and information. And rather than saying to the hospitals, can I have a look at my data, um, what we're uh, proposing is that the, uh, that the Jinger herself would say, well, okay, hospital system, I'm going to allow you time-bound access to the branch of the tree because I want you to look at, at, uh, at a, you know, one of her kids or somebody in my care pathway. I want you to look at their vital signs. I want you to look at their, uh, their medical history. And that kind of obviates the need to, uh, hopefully obviates the need to go into a hospital um, or into a healthcare system um, as often as we can. 85, roughly 85% 85 of diagnosis in primary care is history. Um, so, you know, surely that can be obviated. Why do you have to go in and give your history every time? If you could just look at this in a, in a, in a format that was digestible, we think it would be very powerful. And also helps, I suppose, with that continuity of care as you move through different healthcare systems or different specialists. So, um, so that's what we're working on in terms of, 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 of the tree. We think it will be... Uh, uh, um, a shift in terms of how people think about healthcare and I suppose try and rebalance that equation and move that center of power from the hospitals um, into, into the people that matter most. And even patients isn't the right word here because these are just, you know, it's, it's kind of the humanity of it almost. Um, it's, what, it's what happens when you're not in the doctor, it can be critically important. So this would be an example of a display, with Langus there in the corner. So we'd have information about his scans, his immunization allergies, um, but also through the power of, of tracking devices and technologies, we can now remotely measure um, heart rate, body temperature, uh, blood pressure, respiration rate, pulse ox, a whole range of, of vital signs that actually give huge information to uh, and comfort maybe to, to, the, to, the, to the people in the family themselves, but also from a clinical point of view, oftentimes you know, those folks on the front line are dancing in the dark. They don't know when you were last at the dock, you can't really remember, you're in a panic, you don't know exactly what's been happening in the last 24, 48 hours. This all of a sudden provides huge contextual information um, that we believe will improve the, the outcomes in terms of, of diagnosis. So the results, and almost uh, finished, the results uh, we believe will be a much more, uh, well simplicity, but a much more um, simple, straightforward system, better use of the scarce resource of hospitals, um, because there's still, um, you know, it's not about necessarily that these folks will be seeing less patients, the number of patients is growing, so that's going to continue. It's about can we take some people out of the, out of the, out of the system. Uh, also really the, this notion of engaging and empowering the, uh, the Jing herself we think is a, is, a, is a huge step forward, better quality care for all, and then instantly available, so it's, it's cloud-based, secure, et cetera, everything you'd, uh, you'd expect. So that's all I'm going to say on, on health founders. I'll leave you with a, a, a final thought in terms, I guess, to your question about you know, the resistance and some of the entrenched views that you have in healthcare. Uh, people may have seen this before, but it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a quote, um, so I'll just read it out, that it will, uh, it's a quote about, about a you know, piece of medical technology, that it will ever come into general use, notwithstanding its value is extremely doubtful because it's beneficial uh, application requires much time and gives a good bit of trouble both to the patient and the practitioner because it's hue and character are foreign and opposed to all our habits and associations. So um, this is something that was written in, a, in, a, in the newspaper of record at the time in, in the UK talking about a, uh, a, a medical device. I guess the, the, uh, when people talk about the, the hue and character, that probably gives you a sense that it's from a different time. Um, but this is from an article in the uh, Times of London from 1847. And what they were talking about, anyone recognize this? No guesses, I wouldn't have known either until I saw this, but uh, it's a stethoscope, the first incarnation of a stethoscope. So, you know, if you think about the kind of pushback that people had for something that is now so, so commonplace, um, so this pattern of, 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 of people getting, you know, getting the elbows out and getting entrenched is nothing new, um, and I think it's, it's kind of... Mm, 
when you see something like this, it kind of gives you encouragement. You go, well, now every, you, know, you don't see a, any kind of medic um, without, a, without a stethoscope. Um, really interesting history in how the stethoscope was developed, actually, because um, people um, didn't want doc clinicians or physicians at the time um, didn't want physical contact with patients, particularly uh, patients who were less well off than them. So that was one of the key drivers why they invented the stethoscope, so they wouldn't have to touch them. Um, and obviously, that's evolved into a much more uh, uh, progressive and proper uh, medical device since. So um, I'm going I'm to finish on that. I I think just to, uh, to, to leave you with a quote from Mark Cuban, who's a highly uh, readable and watchable and listenable entrepreneur in the US, um, done amazing stuff. But uh, he talks about, you know, never follow your dreams, follow your effort. So you can spend a lot of time, you know, grazing, thinking, um, but really there's no, um, there's no better thing to do than get out there, take, you know, take the plunge, get product into market, get it tested. Don't spend, you know, years and years doing, uh, doing deep research and thought about it. You know, you're going to need to do that to supplement what you're working on for sure. But he's, you know, talks a lot about follow your efforts. You know, so if, if, if you want to do something, don't think about it for an inordinate length of time. Get going, uh, get it done, and, uh, and keep the shoulder to the wheel, I guess, you know.